Hey guys, in this podcast, we talk a little bit about healthcare and topics relating to healthcare. We just want to let you know that we are not qualified physicians, and you should check with your doctor first before trying any of the things that we suggest in this podcast. Furthermore, we apologize in advance if we misrepresent material from other third parties in this podcast. Please know that we have no intention of doing so. Thanks. Hey guys, welcome to the first Contemplation Hypothesization podcast. Today the topic is... Economics. Okay, our thoughts, feelings, and fears. Paul, what do you want to talk about today? I don't know, why don't we start a little bit about talking about minimum wage? I mean, just like different things that the government does that maybe could be done differently and create different outcomes. Yeah, okay, well my thoughts on this are, when you have minimum wage, uh, the higher the minimum wage, uh, the less spread out the, uh, the the classes are, right? So if you have lower, middle, and higher class, if you raise the minimum wage, then you decrease how much, how much of a difference there are between classes, correct? Well, that's assuming that when the minimum wage is raised, just as many people get jobs because you could actually have the opposite effect. If minimum rate wage is raised too much, then companies hire fewer people and then the lower class, the gap between the lower class and the upper class actually widens. At some point, certain job, certain companies just need people to do jobs. And you, even if you, if you, if you fire people, I'm sorry, you don't have the option to fire people because the company needs X amount of jobs, no matter what, no matter what they have to pay because they have, they are still generating some sort of profit from it. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's going to be some, there's going to be some minimal amount that is required by companies, but they're not going to, you know, say like, Hey Mike, well, I mean, I'll say Mike for now. What is his name? Why don't you do this job for us? They're going to try to minimize those costs, which is in the end going to cause, I mean, most numbers will show that it's going to cause a decrease in the number of people that companies hire because their ultimate goal is to minimize costs so that they can give us products that are cheaper. But theoretically, if there were, were no changes to the number of people that companies hire, then there, would, there wouldn't be a gap unless, of course, the higher minimum wage caused products to be more expensive, which then caused the other classes and the lower classes to have to pay more for products and then, right. then you know, you're not really seeing a change whatsoever at all. Yeah. So then what are, what are your thoughts, Paul? Do you think that minimum wage should be raised, lowered, or kept the same? Um, well, first off, just one of the reasons why we thought this would be cool to talk about is because recently a politician said that, you know, uh, the minimum wage rate should have increased due to people's productivity increasing over time. Um, but she believes, she's a politician, and she believes that the minimum wage is way too low for the amount of work that people are doing, which um, I completely disagree with. And I actually think that minimum wage actually creates a predicament for people who are trying to move up the scale. Oh, um, the socioeconomic ladder. The socio- yeah, and exactly. And that's a great analogy, a ladder. Um, I like to think of minimum wage jobs as like the first rung of a ladder. Right. Without that, you can't move up. You, right. you have to get that job. Right. Um, and ultimately, what happens when minimum wage is raised is that companies hire fewer people, and then fewer people are able to get on that first rung. So... Take, for example, like a job at like McDonald's or something. Sure, you're getting paid minimum wage to work at McDonald's, but to most people, the money isn't why they work at McDonald's. They really work at McDonald's for the job experience. You know, you have to learn how to show up on time, do things correctly, um, have self-control, and work in a professional atmosphere. So at the end of the day, what is most valuable to people working at McDonald's isn't the money, but the experience that allows them to later go on to better jobs. Right, but, and, but ultimately, they do want money. That's why they're showing up from 8 to 5, right? They right, want money, yeah. but they want to get a better job that gives them more yeah, money. Yeah, the idea is it's kind of an entry-level job, and they're, their plan is to work up. It's actually interesting because McDonald's has a 100% turnover on per year on uh, employees. So that means that almost every employee that works there uh, moves out, out somewhere else after the year. Wow. Okay. So um, so what are, so what are you saying? You're saying minimum wage should be kept the same or lowered? Um, I think actually a lot of people would disagree with this, but I think a minimum wage should be removed because really? okay. what companies should be able to, it, it should be a supply and demand thing. A company needs a worker to do this job. They have this amount of money. They should pay the worker that much to do it. What would it then happen is that if they offer jobs that are too low, like $2 an hour, then people just aren't going to take those jobs. Right. Other jobs exist. Uh, they're going to want higher jobs. So people are going to demand higher wages. And I think the way you're going to end up with is a general wage that's around probably what minimum wage is. But at the same time, you're going to have higher employment because there's if, if for example, someone is willing to do a job for $2 an hour, then let them. It's a mutual benefit. The person working is choosing to work for that company that's offering that much money. But when we set a minimum wage, that person who wants that $2 an hour cannot get it. Okay, well, let me ask you a hypothetical question. What if all the, let's just say we take fast food. So Wendy's, McDonald's, Burger King, they all get together and they say, um, with this no minimum wage, we're going to only offer $3 an hour. We're not going to offer any more positions that are more than that. Mm-hmm. And because all these people just lost their job, they're now saying, well, we don't have a job, but there's still this $3 an hour job. So I guess we'll have to take that. Do you see how they have just lost, you know, over half their salary because of that move, that financial move that the, these, the fast food companies could make? Well, okay, so first off, just to dissect that, uh, the, the idea, the notion that competing companies are going to get together and set some standard is is crazy. It doesn't, it doesn't happen. Well, with gas prices, that happens, right? Well, I don't think so. Well, when you, when you have people, I mean, some, I think there's been some speculation that companies in different areas will, com- like, say to the other guy, hey... If you keep yours at 420, I'll keep mine at 420, and together we will make more money. Otherwise, we're both selling it for 360 each, or something like that. Um, you know, I think that's just speculation. I don't think there's much proof of that because at the end of the day, I think if that were true, you'd see 
one or two companies that decides that they're not going to play the game and they're going to okay, give yeah. a lot cheaper price. So like, let's say everyone else is charging four twenty for gas. Like, let's say they don't want to work with that person because they know if they charge three sixty, then every person in the city is going to come and get gas from them, and they're going to get tons of business. So I think the competitive nature of gas prices prevent people from working together. I really don't think that there's enough mutual benefit for the companies to get together and set those prices. It would just take one company, and you just don't see that. You don't see. Yeah. Right. Okay. I got you. So, so you're saying minimum wage should be taken out, and you would get a mutual benefit because both company, both the company and the employee, are benefiting because they've reached a decision that suits best for yeah. both. Yeah. Yeah. I think the fear is that like you were saying, it's sort of a situation where people need jobs and the only jobs available are $3 an hour jobs. But at the end of the day, I don't think that's what's going to happen because uh, companies need employees and they have a demand for employees. And if their rates are too low, I mean, like $3 an hour is hardly even worth like going to work. You, right. you, you can find something else. So um, the thing is, is that like, let's go back maybe 100 years or 200 years before we even had minimum wage. Um, you had people doing uh, sort of what are they called? Like internships, free internships. Um, a lot of times, I remember hearing a story like about apprenticeship. apprenticeship yeah, um, I heard a story about you know a guy who started like a wool company and became like a multimillionaire. But when he started, um, the only job available were like these low wage jobs, and he got a job working at this clothing store. And he asked the guy like, "How much are you gonna pay me?" And the guy's like. Well, I shouldn't have to pay you anything. You're going to be learning a lot, and you can use this later. I mean, obviously, that does, is not always the case, but he basically got paid nothing to work at that job. But the experience that he learned, just like the McDonald's people, you know, they gain valuable life experience and values and stuff that help you succeed in the workforce, is really what will propel you to move forward. But what I'm saying in general is that by setting a minimum wage, we prevent um, the same number of people to get onto that first run of the ladder and then move forward. Hmm, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, so you're saying that basically... If you have lower jobs, like $4 an hour, $5 an hour, you can at least let some people in to start climbing this ladder and then um, go from there. Right, yeah, exactly. The problem right now that we're seeing is uh, a high unemployment rate among these people that just need to get that first job to move forward. Most people, uh, if you look at the statistics on minimum wage jobs, most people don't get a job and stay at that job for the rest of their life. The low wage, there's nothing wrong with the low wage. What's important is that someone's getting a job that's helping better their career. Um, now, some people argue, of course, that, you know, there's these mothers, you know, who have five children and they're supporting them off of a minimum wage job. Uh, and, you know, it might be the case, but at the end of the day, you have to think what benefits the mother more, like continuing to have these minimum wage jobs um, where they continue to have this thing and have fewer employed uh, mothers, yeah. or to have employed mothers who get paid less but have the opportunity to move forward, and you have to weigh the consequences. Ultimately, there's no opt there's an optimal solution, but there's no perfect solution. Yeah, and I think one thing too is that um, we've seen, like from economic standpoint, that crime goes down when people are busy. Like when you have a job that you have to go to, you don't have time to organize a bank robbery, or um, you're not just sitting at home doing nothing. And going to work actually lets people psychologically feel like they're valuable and they're worth something no matter what the actual pay is. So you could do $3 an hour, $7 an hour, $10 an hour, but the fact, the phrase you can, of I am going to work, or I'm gonna be late for work, that yeah. itself carries a lot of psychological weight that I think would uh, get people motivated to climb the ladder in the first place. Yeah, definitely. There's definitely that psychological aspect of it. Uh, you know, it's really interesting that you actually brought up criminals in this, uh, because it's a very related topic to wage, uh, criminal behavior, and criminal behavior is a really fascinating area of study, which I recommend everybody look into, but. Uh, we have this impression that criminals aren't rational people and stuff, um, and that they're always going to act the same way regardless of the laws that our society forces them to abide by. Um, and it's just not the case. Uh, it's really interesting. Like, if you look at before World War II, if, if you lived in Britain and you were involved in a crime where someone was shot with a gun, whether or not you were the person that shot the gun, just the fact that there's a gun there and both the punishment, if you were caught, or was that you guys, you both would be hung. And so what started happening is like when people committed crimes, they started frisking each other to make sure that there was no gun found on them <laughs> because they didn't want to yeah, get hung if right. they had they been caught. And so you know, some criminals a lot of times will actually weigh the consequences of being caught, which we don't tend to think, but they do to some degree. Um, and then that would also, you know, lead into like gun laws and stuff and how their effect on society. I don't know if you want to talk about that because it's a pretty controversial. Yeah, we can stick more on economics, but yeah. I agree with you that it's definitely an interesting twist um, for whether we should have free wage in the first place uh, or a minimum wage or just um, no minimum wage. Um, and I think same same time, another topic that's highly controversial is uh, like a free capitalistic market where everything is completely capitalistic owned by companies or versus how much the government should own. Yeah. Oh, definitely. That's. 
I, that's like the big debate right now in kind of the difference between a conservative and a liberal. A liberal wants more government intervention, uh, you know, especially on matters of health care, gun control, abortion, while conservatives tend to want less, uh, more lazy or fair policies uh, in government. Um, at the end of the day, uh, I tend to side more with like the libertarian approach, which is just less government intervention in both social and government things. I guess we could talk about, uh, you know, why you know, some of the aspects of government and stuff. Yeah, I think uh, one thing that strikes me pr- particularly interesting is health care, um, because I'm going into that, and how uh, Obamacare is really changing how the U.S. functions. Um, I think one thing that is going to be interesting to see is how people who are not very well off uh, matriculate into the health care system and how that affects the health care system, the, the quality of health care system overall. Um so what I mean by that is uh, a lot of times uh, people who don't don't have the money to don't have medical health insurance and they don't have much money but they're starting to make some will actually not go see the doctor because they don't want that they don't want to pay that tab. I mean just to walk into the ER here at Cincinnati it's over eight hundred dollars just from walking into the room. Um, that, that's a lot of money uh, just to pay for an ER visit for a flu virus or something. Mm-hmm. And so what ends up happening is people end up accumulating a disease a chronic disease and then they have to come in when it gets so bad that their only option is to come into the hospital right um i think the hope with obamacare is that no matter how you're feeling good or bad you come into the hospital and uh it's more of a preventative preventative approach yeah that's what i was going to say is that um ultimately with the government taking more responsibility of health care they're going to want to minimize their costs because those, that money is coming out of their pocket so it's really important to them to do preventative things like you know twenty dollars now to a doctor's visit uh, 10 years before your cancer moves on to a level that's, uh, you know, where you're going to need chemotherapy and all of these expensive treatments is going to save the government tons of money. And that's why you see, like, in New York City, for example, which I think it's the whole state of New York, you see, like, limits on the size of soda and stuff. Because now that the government's starting to take responsibility for health care, they're doing all they can to prevent it. And some people would argue that they're crossing the lines because where does it end? You know, right. they're going to require you to eat vegetarian diets or what? Obviously, that's not going to be the case, but... It is right. interesting to see how the government starts. So, right, so that's the downside of having more government intervention. They they call the shots. Um, but whereas if you had a free market capitalistic society, it's the companies are calling the shots. As, so as far as that the company doesn't have a monopoly, I think that's when the problem occurs. Yeah, um, you know, I think there's a lot of economists who have a lot to say on this matter. I think most economists, and I could be wrong, would say that the best system would be one that is freely uh, competing against each other and stuff. But what has happened is that there's been so much regu- government regulation and subsidies that this the opportunity for companies to freely compete has gone away, and that's why we've seen prices skyrocket. But I don't want to get too much into that because I actually don't know the details of it, but that's just sort of a the perspective that I've heard before is that ultimately we want to shoot for pure competition, but because of government intervention and s- subsidies, there really can't be that competition at the moment. Yeah, right. One thing I wanted to mention, backtracking to healthcare, we can kind of shift from the economy to healthcare interventions and how that will affect the economy, is um, the invention of the smartphone. A lot of people don't really think much about it, but it is really starting to transform how healthcare is viewed. Uh, there's two inventions I want to talk about, both the smartphone and Watson. A lot of people don't care much about smartphones. People love smartphones. But, but they, don't, they, they, don't care, they, don't, they don't realize, I think a lot of um, high up physicians don't realize the, the potential yeah. that they have to undermine the, phys- the, the position of a doctor itself. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, you know, a lot of physicians will say something like, well, a smartphone or a computer can't replace uh, a physician because there's an, an emotional aspect to patient health care, seeing the patient, talking to the patient, reaffirming the patient that they are truly being understood, uh, mm-hmm. both from a physical and emotional perspective. But I think uh, that's starting to change now. Um, and people are starting to question how much of that emotional aspect is really true, or is it just really just, do people just want the drug and to get out and get cured and go on? That's an interesting it? question, actually. And, you know, I think actually psychology can show us something about that. Like their psychology therapy, uh, there was a uh, psychologist in the 70s Maslow uh, Maslow was one of them um, and there's another that I can't recall his name right now but they were humanist humanist um, psychologists and one of their ideas of therapy was like you know we don't need to help the person necessarily um, you know overcome their defense mechanisms and all these things that Freud said but what we just need to be is like a listening body that you know shows empathy understands the person and that w- will be enough to make improvements in the rest of their life and I think that a doctor sort of plays that role like when we feel sick we want attention uh, I mean yeah. I see it all the time with people I know like as soon as they're sick they're like they're like yay I'm sick so now people will, sh- will show some sort of like empathy towards me which right. is completely fine there's nothing wrong with it but um, you know you go to your doctor and you can kind of 
that emotional relationship is uh, definitely a good part of it. But I think that there are people out there who don't really care about that. And there's also doctors who aren't very good at it, so their (laughs) patients would prefer to just have a computer. Right. Well, um, so basically, I think the one thing I want to talk about was the Tricoder X Prize. And this is, um, the X Prize Foundation is founded by Peter Diamandis. He's an entrepreneur. And basically, the prize goal uh, by 2015 is to come up this is a $10 million prize. The goal is to come out with a smartphone that can diagnose a set of diseases better than a qualified board of certified doctors. Wow. Um, yeah. So whether that's through like a, like you breathing on the, the cell phone or the smartphone scans your eyes or um, some, or it has like some intelligent software that communicates um, data that you input about your symptoms um, to another computer, like a cloud computing source. Um, I think this has really the potential to change um, a lot of common cases seen. Now I'm not saying it would, re- it would replace like, you know, the physician itself, but a lot of, times um, we come in to the, to the doctor's office because we have a simple flu like a virus yeah. which they can't do anything for because we, oh, we, we don't have antivirals yet I should say um, but uh, I mean they can give you like some ibuprofen or something to help you but um, a lot of times like you know you come in and they're just like well um, you know you could do this and this and this you know we'll give you some tips of how to uh, retain like to help you recover but there's not an actual like drug we're going to give you that will exactly combat this virus and the smartphone could have just told you all that information that the doctor could have wow. um, and, the st- and the smartphone itself if it had like RNA or DNA sequence- sequencers on there could actually sequence the, the virus and tell you exactly which virus you had and exactly which medication or uh, drugs or therapy you should take um, so uh, just FYI for everybody DNA and RNA are basically these uh almost programmed language if you will like computers have zeros and ones we have like ATs and C's and that's the programming for viruses or bacteria or humans um, mm-hmm. um, well yeah. yeah and then obviously the side effect of such smartphones would be reduced health costs I mean because the visits you know these these short visits to doctors without health insurance can cost you like $100, $200 right. and so you're not going to for one, because of their expense a lot of people aren't going to go in and get them and then their problems going to become less treatable in the future and there's going to be higher costs, but at the same time, um, now with a cheaper way, people are going to get that stuff for free, probably. Or with smartphones, will come down in price, and such technology will come down in price, and people will be able to get that diagnosis, which in, which could very well be better because, as we all know, I mean, doctors are subjective beings, just like people, and they're obviously subject to a lot of um, fallacies and things like that. They'll make errors in diagno- they make errors in diagnosis all the time. A computer isn't going to make those errors and it has a potential to be even better right yeah I mean there's even talk of uh, turning your phone into a 3D scanner so you would scan both the inside of your body and you could like see like um, visually what's going on in your body and things like that um, but I should say just as a to be fair that smartphones could also uh, have errors um, you know like maybe you don't put in maybe it sequences the wrong bacteria and then gives you a false diagnosis or maybe um, when you breathe on it it doesn't capture everything like the sensor is blocked or something like that there, there's all these problems that could go wrong with smartphones and we'll have to see how it turns out in the next uh, couple of years when they start coming out um, I think the other thing that is going to change healthcare that really can I want to say replace but it would severely, severely affect uh, physicians is uh, a program called Watson, IBM's Watson. Uh, this was the famous computer that won Jeopardy in 2011 against the best two Jeopardy players. Now, a lot of people are thinking to themselves, like, okay, a computer wants one against Jeopardy. Like, what's the big deal? All they did is just put all the answers in a computer and the computer just spit it out. That's actually not the case. Um, what the case was is the computer read all these encyclopedias, including our reliable Wikipedia, and uh, <laughs> it just read it, and it understood what it read, and based upon what it read, it produce the answers for Jeopardy. So what does this have to do with medicine? The, the thing is, is that when you take uh, research that comes out from like cancer articles, it, it's a lot of information and it's really hard yeah. to keep up to date on them. But what Watson is doing now is it's reading all these lung cancer cases. And when a patient comes in with lung cancer, it's telling the physicians based upon all these symptoms the patient has, based upon all the latest research I've read, and based upon all the past research that you have over 50, accumulation of over 50 years, this is the diagnosis I would make, and this is the treatment I would suggest for the patient. What are your thoughts? <laughs> you know, so when you have like a computer that can do all of that, I mean, imagine that not only in lung cancer, but every field. It could read radiology graphs. It could see like how a patient has broken their uh, bone, and they could it could make it could scan their bone and then use a three D printer to reprint their bone. Um, there's all these things that a computer could do so much better than a human at the fraction of a cost that could uh, undermine the role of a physician in terms of healthcare. Yeah. And then on top of that, I mean, med school would be a lot cheaper. All they have to teach the med students is to trust the computer. <laughs> yeah. Put all of your faith inside this machine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so I think, I think the future of medicine, um, especially with uh, 
the idea of 3D printing smartphones in Watson, um, you know, if you combine Watson, like a cloud computing source with smartphones, it could really help the lower class in terms of preventative medicine. It could, yeah. it, I think it could really transform the well, quality. What would be like interesting about this is how quickly it can be implemented. Once we have the technology, which may be 20 or 30 years, how fast can we get to the point where we're using it on these lower class people that need it? And like as we all know, our government is incredibly slow at implementing things like this. And there's so many regulations on the medical industry. And so that would be the thing is like once we get to have this technology, how quickly can we implement it yeah. and use it? Well, I think, I think here's the thing. You know, you, you make a good point about the government. Things do move slowly. Um, but I think with smartphones, apps move very quickly. Right. Uh, like you can, you, I mean, you can upload an app to Google Play or the iTunes store and thousands, millions of people can instantly download yeah. it. Um, the question really is, is building the sensing capabilities in the smartphone. So if the smartphone has a DNA sequencer in it, then it's then you can make all the apps in the world that will use this DNA sequencer. Yeah. Right. But do you think that the government will get involved in these apps? Like, let's say there's an app that does like an X-ray of your arm to see if you broke something. Obviously, you probably wouldn't be able to read it, but the, the phone would be able to tell you whether you have a broken bone or not. Like this this smartphone app is giving you information regarding your health and it's very important. So if it had like a virus or something or some something messed up and it told you something wrong and um, you went to the hospital to get your arm amputated, turns out you don't <laughs> turns out you didn't need to and there's no broken bone, then uh Who's to blame? I mean, is the, do you sue the app company? Yeah. Like, the responsibility, don't you think the government will have to jump in and say, like, in order to get this app, it needs to reach it? Like, sort of FDA approval of right. apps and stuff. Yeah, most certainly. I mean, I think, I mean, getting, like, an, an amputation is a very serious thing. You'd obviously, <laughs> you, you would, op- no matter what the computer is saying, you're going to, you're going to talk to somebody that's about it. Yeah, that. that's true. Yeah. Um, but I'm talking more about the Just small basic. cases that yeah. are huge, like, that make up a huge portion of doctor visits that just may not need to happen if some right, assistant yeah. can just tell you okay, some basic yeah. information. Um, and I think it, it, everything always starts small and then it grows its capability. Mm-hmm. Google search started small. It can only search a couple articles. Now it has a knowledge graph of telling you what exactly an object is. Yeah. Um, it, so I think you know, like the Tricoder X Prize is just one step. And with time and with cell phones constantly improving their capabilities, we'll see something emerge that uh, could at least, at least assist uh, healthcare. Then when we see something emerge, we'll have your name on it. Will you be the one? Because you, you sound like you should design this. You, there's a lot of money involved. Oh, I think there'll be a tremendous amount of money involved. Yeah. Yeah, right. Um, but I, I think also at the same time, there's going to be a lot of competition. Um, I mean, if you just look at the competition for smartphones right now, it's ridiculous. Imagine If you imagine adding like a healthcare capability to smartphones, they would... They would. I mean, I don't know. We maybe even increase the price of them by fifty percent. I mean, yeah. if you if you're not seeing a dentist or I'm sorry, a doctor about it, um, I mean, that could be a huge. Another point is yeah. like we could have dental apps too. Yeah, like you yeah, just they, run it over your teeth and it's like, oh, you have a cavity. Yeah, but then, but it still needs to treat you somehow. So then you'd still have to see the dentist for that. Yeah. Right. But you could be alerted before you know your next dentist visit, and so that would be benefit you a lot. Yeah, or it could show you that you're not flossing right, and you need to floss in this area. Or yeah, and something like that, like you know, flossing a flossing app or like a toothbrushing app, app. <laughs> <laughs> something like that that can tell you like, oh, you're missing this area or that area. It yeah, could save you a lot of money in like dental bills. Right, um, and also just keep your overall health more stable. Yeah, right. I think I think that's one major area is, and for smartphones at least, yeah. is the area of healthcare. Um, well, you know, another thing on this topic is that there's already apps out there that can help you a lot with your health and stuff, and they've been used. Now, there's this really cool app. It was either a Stanford or a Harvard grad made it, um, and basically, it's an app that encourages you to work out. And huh. the way it does it is it uses money as an incentive. So when you sign up, you put your credit card information in, and every time you work out, you don't lose money. But if you don't work out, you lose money. It just charges right to your card. And the way it knows whether you're there is it has all these different workout facilities in the countries in its system, and it uses a GPS tracker, and you have to be in that gym for 30 minutes. Otherwise, it charges you money. <laughs> oh and you can gosh. set the amount of money like that you lose. Like You can set it all the way up to like $50. Where does the money go to? If you, if the money all gets compiled into this pot and stuff, and then if you work out enough days, you get a share of it. You get to split it with the rest of the people. Wow, okay. Because uh, at the end of the day, a lot of people aren't going to... It, like they're gonna work out because they don't want to lose like ten bucks. Yeah, that's so funny. So you can actually make money from working out if you. Yeah, like, you can make money it. from working out. Wow, that's funny. <laughs> I actually, I was reading one guy who was talking about how one week he had the flu. He got the flu like in the middle of the week, so he'd already set the price and stuff. And he's like, "I'm just going to the gym." Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, like threw off. <laughs> <and stuff. laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I probably wouldn't recommend. Yeah, that. and then there's um there's also a really good apps for diet stuff. Um, you can a lot of cell phones use the camera as a barcode scanner, and it has these huge data. Ha- they have these huge databases of foods and stuff. So you scan it with your cell phone, and it pops up, and um, it tells you every you know nutritional yeah. fat about it, like how many calories, how many grams of fat, and it compiles this all into one thing. And at the end of the week, it can tell you like which nutrients you're deficient on, which ones you're getting too much on. I, for example, was like getting like fifteen thousand milligrams of sodium, and you're supposed to get like two thousand a day or something. <laughs> I'm not exactly a member. I can't remember, yeah. but it was insane. But I was it, getting, it like, let you know, and yeah, yeah and then I stopped. Wow, that's, drinking salt. That's great. You know, one thing, <laughs> another thing about cell phone um, that I want to talk about. Michio Kaku has written about this. Is that cell phones and the internet has opened us up into a new, a new terminology for the market, and that's um, complete free capital. I, I believe he called it free capitalism, or, or I, I forgot how exactly the name he called it, but. The idea was is that we used to have like local capitalism or a local price market where in California things would be more pricey than things in Michigan, ah, that's right? But that's now, like on Amazon, if you were to buy anything on Amazon throughout the U.S., it's the same price. Wow! So you're getting so it's leveling the price across the entire world. So basically, if you live in a city where your wages are way higher, you can buy a lot more. Yeah. Beforehand. You know, your higher wage didn't really do anything because right. you were paying more for everything you bought. It, exactly, right. So, like, if you lived in California, you're probably better off buying everything through Amazon. Wow. Then, then, but, like, so so the idea is, is that you could scan, you're at a grocery store, you can scan an Apple or a product, and then instantly Amazon will tell you how much it's selling that product for. Yeah. And so this is, this is a big threat to, like, retail departments, like Kroger's or Myers, because people will start thinking to themselves, well, hey, you know, I could buy this on Amazon for three-fourths of the cost. Why am I buying it here? I mean, the only disadvantage with Amazon is you have to wait for it in the mail. But, you know, Amazon now has, like, two-day shipping. Yeah, but then, um, you know, like, we're, we're seeing a job shift, like, people working grocery stores to people becoming delivery men because there's yeah. more jobs that are needed to shift. Um, that gets into an interesting topic on economics, too, is automation. Yeah. And, you know, like, a lot of people will say, like, oh, you know, if we implement these new... Um, machines and stores like self scanning machines, then people are going to lose their jobs. You're not going to have the person on the you know floor who you know helps you find the product and stuff. You're not going to have the cashier, um, and people are legitimately concerned about how these machines could take away jobs. But actually, the analogy I always use for this is: should we get rid of uh, backhoes and just have everyone dig holes? Right. You know, like if we're going to dig a giant hole, we could have a hundred people take that hole or to have one backhoe do it right and so the objective of an economy isn't to supply jobs to people it's to supply material and services services and materials and stuff and products yeah and products and stuff and so it doesn't if products are available cheap it doesn't necessarily matter that fewer people have jobs because more people can buy with the less that they have yeah um i completely agree with you i think actually each economy has a certain amount of wealth and ideas create more wealth right actually uh Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but, you know, in economics classes, you'll always see the supply and demand curve. Um, or not the curve, it's um, it's pretty much a linear line um, where, well, you know, basically, uh, just the supply and demand chart. Like, um, what you see are these shifts where uh, normally the supply and demand stays on this line, but you'll see a shift where suddenly there's way more supply and way more demand. Yeah. Um, and that's exactly what you're talking about is when an economy's growth actually increases right to more to a higher level than it was before yeah so like with the the, ho- the backhoe example yeah um you were saying how 100 people let's just say 100 people were required to take a hold now only one person can do the job so that frees up 99 people to do another job yeah. um and that is so if 99 people also used a backhoe then they can also dig 100 they can dig 99 right. more and that's holes. what you see is you see this like this push on how much demand can be supplied. Right, um, right. So I think... Supply demand. <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah. So basically, um, I, I agree with you that, you know, a lot of people think automation, computers, and machines are taking jobs from people. And to be honest, they are. They are. You ha- But you have to look... You can't look at just the short term, the first picture. Like, of course, all those people digging holes, they're losing their jobs. And they're going to go out and have no jobs for a while. But when you look 10 years down the road, they have better jobs and the whole economy has more that it produces. Yeah, so I think, well, I, this is a, uh, I'm kind of on the other side of the fence for this. So let me, um, in the past, every time we've had some sort of technology or revolution, the people who were put out of jobs were always able to find another job. And the other job they found was probably a little bit better. Um, hmm. So instead of like, so we used to have like 60% of us used to be farmers in the 1900s. Now, 60% of us are probably staying at desk jobs, which are probably a little bit easier Which are much backs. more leisurely. Yeah, 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 they're much easier on your backs. You can get a coffee break if you need it. So the point now is that 
we're at a point where actually computers are starting to take those desk jobs. Uh, mm -hmm. And because of that, like an example would probably be like you're, that when you go to the grocery store and you go to the checkout line and you can see some people are checking people out, but then other you have those automated machines that check you out as well. Another example is when you go to the airport and you need to check in for your flight, uh, you can do that through a terminal, a computer terminal now instead of a person. Mm -hmm. So the point is, is that these jobs are being replaced, displaced, and the problem is now is that once the people get fired from these test jobs, they actually can't find another job. And the reason is, is because computer intelligence is actually catching up with human intelligence. And computer intelligence is cheaper than human intelligence. But you're saying that at the moment that people can't get new jobs, they're losing their jobs? Uh, well, or are you saying like, well, you know, and, like eventually? And eventually, like I'm saying in about 10 years this will happen, but it's already starting to happen. Um, there's yeah. certain jobs that just simply did not require that much intelligence. And because of that, computers have already taken that amount of right, intelligence. Yeah. An example of this is a, it was like a store, like a shelf stocker. So if you look at Amazon's um, yeah, storage, yeah. they don't have anybody storing anything. I mean, I, I don't mean to be condescending here, but it doesn't take much intelligence to read a label and then go to the area where that label sells to go. Some might argue that it takes a lot of intelligence, but I'm well, just kidding. <laughs> I mean, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm in no way trying to be uh, condescending because those people were needed to, to make that work yeah. in the beginning. But now it just... There's no what I I like to call idea creation. There's no um, there's not that much intelligence required to f simply follow a direction on a box and store it. Yeah. And so now computers. Um, I think Amazon bought Kaiva. Um, and that and what it, that is is just a set of robots that s read the label and they store it where the label tells them where to store it. Um, and it's like a huge network of these things. There's like hundreds of these guys in this in this huge de uh, huge department. So um, the the point is is that if you have a low intelligence job, not a low intelligence job where you're not creating more ideas and you're doing the same thing over and over again, uh, that is what is uh, in danger. Uh, those are the types of jobs that are in yeah, danger. Yeah, you definitely, like, certain skill sets that can be reproduced by a computer at a lower cost um, are, you might have to go to college and learn something new. You might have to learn a new skill. I kind of foresee sort of a, you know, sort of a service shift. You know, as, as people's jobs are taken by computers, then people are going to start working more service oriented job like you know waitress waiter those jobs can't yeah. necessarily they could be replaced but at the end of the day a lot of people prefer having like a human contact i mean humans relationships are probably the most important thing to people yeah well let me let me explain something on that real quick so mm -hmm. um this there's some explanation but it's worth the wait so basically uh computer intelligence is measured in flops or floating operations per second and uh, so an operation is basically like six times three is 18 um and an operation per second is how many operations you can do in one second. So according to a lot of different, um, a lot of people think that the human has 10 to the 16th flops. So that's 10 with 16 zeros behind that flops. So that's a lot of thinking per second. Um, by comparison, you can buy a computer today that has about uh, 10 to the 12th flops. So your computer is about 10,000 times dumber than you uh, for $1,000. Yeah. And you mentioned how, well, people aren't, People like emotional beings to talk to them about service-oriented jobs. Mm. It just so happens that that emotional intelligence actually is the highest level of intelligence. So computers simply aren't able to calculate emotional intelligence yet. That's the problem. Interesting. So the idea is that in about 10 years, according to all these past trends over the last 50 years, in about 10 years, so 2023, you will have, you can for $1,000, you will be able to buy 10 to the 16th flops uh, for computing power, and then those computers will be able to calculate emo emotional intelligence, um, and so that even threatens the service jobs. Um, so that that's what the concern yeah, is. Yeah, well, actually, honestly, when I hear that, uh, when you think kind of beyond the first initial step of everyone being unemployed and stuff, you see that wow, so computers are doing our work cheaper than we are. They're doing our service work cheaper than we are manufacturing all of this stuff cheaper than we are they don't cost the company that much so basically what's going to be happening in these companies is that they're going to be able to produce products at much cheaper rates for people to buy then yes yeah. they're going to con goals of companies is to produce cheaper products so basically we will get to the point where we don't have to do anything we just like almost get free stuff from the store we just need like yeah the small jobs the idea is is that the idea is with this is you could literally get you can literally produce something for free um and if everything is being produced for free you don't need a job. Yeah, and actually that may be possible. I mean, it might not be infeasible that in the future we yeah. don't need jobs because everything right. can be produced. But I think, I think the rocky part is the transition from where everything costs something to the where everything is free. Because during this time, and I think it's already started, people are going to start getting unemployed. So you'll have some people that can buy, they have this buying power, and then some people can't. 
and some things will be free and some things won't be free and so it, it won't be it, it, it'll, it'll be a very weird economy I think I don't even, it'll, I mean imagine transferring from the economy we have right now to the economy where everything is free yeah you know I think that the thing is that the change will be gradual right. you know the unemployment rate is not going to get to like 20% most likely it's going to probably stay like around 6 to 15% and maybe at the worst worst case scenario would be like 15% so yeah, sure, there's going to be people out of their jobs, but you have to look at the net economy in whole. Like, There's going to be some people that are like really screwed over by this, and they're going to lose their jobs and stuff. But you've got to look at, you know, maybe companies are producing products cheaper, and now everybody else is benefiting from this. And so ultimately, at the end of the day, if you're one of those people that gets screwed over, you're going to have to reassess your life decisions and maybe pursue a different career path. Right, yeah. But I think I think here's the problem. I mean, you can always pursue a different career path, but... The career paths that are the, require the most amount of intelligence tend to have the most amount of training involved in them. Um, so, for example, like um, doing being, becoming a shelf stocker, which doesn't require that much intelligence, didn't have much training to begin with. But another job, such as maybe um, like a lawyer, for example, a lawyer is yeah. constantly creating new ideas that fight different arguments. That is an enormous amount of thinking and it's an enormous amount of training. You just can't decide tomorrow to become a lawyer. That's a lot of schooling you have to go through. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's true. And, but I think at the same time that all of this is going on, you have to remember that we're seeing a transition in education, too. All this new technology is making education more attainable, more affordable, and all this. And uh, what you're going to see is that I don't think it's going to be infeasible that 15 years from now you can get a law degree online that's just as good as one you get at university for, like, $200 or something. I completely agree with you. So, yeah. um, I know, think yeah. at, the, at the time, you can't look at... You know the challenges right now. You have to look at how to, uh, education is going to also change. Yes, I agree with you. I think um, a lot of people, like with Khan Academy or Coursera, these are um, sources that I think could easily replace uh, an official degree from a university or from graduating your GED from high school. Um, Especially GED from high school. I mean, there's, yeah. there's definitely people out there who could be finished with high school by the time they're freshmen in high school. Yeah, you know, they don't need to sit through these 160 day years of classes when they could just pass the stuff and move on and right move forward right yeah um yeah so you know kind of getting back to the main topic um i think we're, we're talking about economics i think at the end of the day what what happens with politicians and our economy is that when a politician is elected he's expected by those who elect him to do something and someone who doesn't do something doesn't get re-elected. So I think it provides sort of this incentive to to do stuff. But a lot of times with a free market economy, the last thing you want to do is intervene and do stuff. Right. Um, actually, what you'll see, what, I think it was a couple of years ago, or maybe it was like 15 years ago, there was a, a bridge that collapsed and a bunch of people died. Um, and what happened was that the politicians weren't giving money to fix these bridges because it wasn't giving them enough uh, like, in, like influence over the populace. Like, if they did that, no one noticed. No one cared. Oh. You know, maintenance on bridges, maintenance is on roads. Like, yeah, it's, it's not that big of a It's deal. not a big deal, and it's not something that you get reelected for. Um, and so you'd see this problem all over the country. It's like bridges and roads weren't being taken care of because politicians need to. Like, their objective is to get reelected. Right. And to get reelected, they must do something. And the way our populace is is that we would rather see something try and fail than nothing tried at all. But at the, when you're looking at a free market economy, that's trying and failing really screw things up. I mean, yeah. uh, you look at a, a, a topic, an area of this sort of thing is the Great Depression talks um, and Franklin D. Roosevelt and sort of the New Deal and the programs that followed that. Um, a lot of people in the country were really happy that the government was getting involved to do something about the depression, but almost all economists think that the government intervention slowed down the progress through the economy. Had we not intervened, we would have gone out of the depression much quicker. Right, but right. But the people of the country were re-elected Franklin D. Roosevelt four times. He was that popular. Because um, he did because something. Because he did something. And the same can be seen um, in the 70s with Jimmy Carter. He set price controls on different things. And, you know, at first maybe it had some benefits, but it was disastrous. But people re-elected him. Well, I don't I can't remember if he got re-elected or not. I, you know, I think maybe he'd been a senator at that time, but we, we'd have to look it up. But he, uh, I think he was reelected actually. Um, uh, but what was important was they did something and the people liked him, but what he did was disastrous. And it didn't, it, um, it didn't get fixed until Reagan finally took all these price controls off. Right. So, yeah. So just the fact people like seeing action taken despite whether the action fails. And if you do fail, like the, the, there's a uh, Freakonomics did a podcast on this where 
yes, you can fail. Like you, it's always good to try. And you, people say, well, it's either you do nothing or you try and you succeed or you try and you fail. I think the problem is, is that sometimes when you try and you fail, you the, the realization is, is that you could have tried something else that would have succeeded, or you could have just done nothing. Nothing. And a lot of times, a free market economy warrants nothing for it to be successful. Like if you look at the most recent economy crash on the mar- the housing bubble crash, um, a lot of that, if you trace it backwards, can be um, thought of to be caused by like the creation of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and government agencies that provided lower rate mortgages to people. Um, and what you know, Bill Clinton thought of when he was president was like, the American dream should be attainable by all people. Every person should be able to buy this house. And so he created these agencies, which made it so that almost everybody could get a mortgage. What ended up happening was people who were getting houses um, that shouldn't be getting houses and didn't have the money to pay for them. Well, then the prices went up and the bubble collapsed. He did something and he was very popular for it. But then you let 10 years down the road and the effects are disastrous. Um, and that's just the way it is. Is like We let these people for four years, eight years, six years, and it's not enough time to see the consequences of the decisions that they actually make. Yeah, right. They don't, and they're because objective. By the time, yeah, by the time they're out of office, um, the, like, the impact happens when they're out of office. Yeah, yeah right. So I guess that's, that's all the time we have for today. But um, thanks for listening, guys. Really appreciate it. And stay tuned for our next episode.